Hello and welcome back for another Earth Science Lecture. Uh, this one will actually be broken up into three parts. And so we'll start off with the first one being Earth Science, Modern Astronomy and Our Place in the Cosmos. Now to kind of recap where we've journeyed so far in this course, you know, Earth Science as a discipline covers, you know, geology, oceanography, climatology, and astronomy. So again, we're just going to be dabbling a little bit into the realms of astronomy and if this at all interests you I highly suggest that you look into taking an actual astronomy course where you could spend 16 weeks versus just spending you know uh, less than an hour in total lecture so um, again really big picture stuff and I highly suggest you take you know, that opportunity so let's talk about modern astronomy historic astronomy and our place within the cosmos so let's start at the beginning with the Greeks so early astronomy, uh, especially observed by the Greeks, was an actual observed interpretation of what was out and above us, you know, within the, uh, you know, the visual aspect of the sky. So astronomy is a science that studies the universe, uh, observation and interpretation of all celestial bodies. So again, the difference between observation and interpretation observation is clearly what is identified what you can see and then interpretation is the result the reasoning and really looking into the future uh, so as an example you know this you know the the observation of this purple pen is that it's a purple pen and it's made uh, by it's called an energel blah 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 now the interpretation is what it's used for how is it made what can it be used for does it have ink these are things that we may or may not actually have the true uh, answer for but the observation is really just if I had to replicate and explain to you that I'm holding a purple pen that is the observation now what I'm doing with it and what I will do with it is part of its interpretation so uh, the Greeks used obviously uh, observational data um, and at that point, then there was the idea of the geocentric model, meaning that the Earth is in the middle and everything must be around us. Now, um, is that the case? Well, no. Later we learned that we're actually a heliocentric model in which that the sun is in the middle, although it's not quite in the middle, it's a little offset, and that everything kind of goes around it within our location. So I included this little diagram uh, showing uh, where Alexandria and Cyan. Um, this is I brought I threw this in here specifically because of Eratosthenes, who was a Greek philosopher. He was the first person to measure their circumference around the Earth and realize that there is a curve to the planet itself. Uh, you know, a lot really happened out of, out of Alexandria, including when you know looking into the Greeks, into modern astronomy, into the observational aspect of looking into the sky. So a lot was done there during that time. Uh, the reason that this works out is because um, Eratosthenes at the time realized that you could be in two different places at the exact same time, and that the shadows within the wells would look differently based on their observation. So that was the wells in Alexandria and Cyan. So what he did there is looked at the observational aspect and then applied the interpretational piece to then learn that you could actually use those angular differences in those shadows to calculate curvature. Was he correct with his numbers? No, not quite, but he was actually really close. He's actually the closest out of anyone at that point understanding the, the true diameter uh, of the Earth itself. But nonetheless, we, we move forward. So looking at the birth of astronomy, so uh, Copernicus concluded the Earth is a planet and proposed that we are heliocentric, meaning that we're not the middle, that we are offset. The sun is going to be our middle aspect, and then all the planets outside from the sun within our little model uh, all operate together. So Johannes Kepler discovered the three laws of planetary motion, as well as understanding the distance of an AU, which is an astronomical unit, which is about 150 million kilometers. So the first law is that the orbits are elliptical. Uh, you know, we can say that it's somewhat circular, but they're not always perfectly circular. It's a perfect, you know, globe, kind of like the Earth. The Earth is on a perfect circle. It's an oblate spheroid. It's elliptical, so it's a little bit bigger in the middle. Uh, the second law was that the planets travel at different speeds uh, in multiple different aspects, uh, being based either on its rotation or its orbit, uh, and that there is a relationship between the planet's orbit and the distance from the sun. So that being said, is what is, deal what is happening with the planet's orbit 
as it goes around the sun? Is there a correlation with its distance and where it is? And then looking into just really the, the development of that planet, the development of those atmospheres, and then even looking then at um, the surface temperatures. So moving forward, uh, here's a very simplistic diagram. So we've got to bring in Sir Isaac Newton, who obviously formulated the, and tested the laws of gravity. <clears throat> and where do we see that in this, uh, you know, looking into astronomy? Well, if this is the sun looking at a heliocentric model, and if we're the Earth going around the sun, we see that, if, you know, obviously that there, this is no oblate spheroid, that, you know, we're not a perfect circle. We see that we're closer to the sun in December, January, and farther in July and August. Uh, we learned this looking at uh, the reasons for the seasons uh, presentation. Well, since and when we are closer to the sun, you see that we actually move faster, and that's because of gravity. Uh, we actually travel faster around the sun, then we get slung out where we travel much slower, and then as we get closer to the sun again, we speed up. We saw this exact same diagram, but one in motion, looking at the reasons for the seasons presentation. But I just wanted to put this back in here because this also plays an effect on looking at the more um, the more visual aspect of the orbital properties of planets. And each planet has its own style in which it travels. But this is just looking at Earth's in particular. Moving forward, the motions of the Earth. So there are three motions, uh, well, technically four if you want to bring them individual. Uh, we're going to be looking at the rotation, the revolution. We'll also look at perihelion and then aphelion. So the rotation is the actual turning or spinning of our planet, of Earth. So what does the rotation mean? Well, we rotate one solar day. That is about 24 hours. So we rotate one solar day, right? Um, so sidereal day is one complete rotation, 360 degrees, within the retrospect and respect to a star, which our actual days are 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. So we have a solar day in which we rotate. Now a revolution is a motion along a path. So we revolution, as a revolution piece, we go all the way around the sun in one year, which is actually 365 and a one quarter day. But we go around throughout the course of a calendar year. Uh, the perihelion is when the Earth is actually closest to the sun. And the aphelion is when, or the aphelion, uh, is when you are actually farthest from the sun in July. So these are all dealing with motions of the Earth. The two here are rotation and revolution. So again, the rotation itself and then the revolution that goes all the way around. So we also have this. Um, I bring this in specifically because uh, at some point you might learn a little bit more about uh, glaciations and there is a mathematician who came up with that's identified as the Milankovitch cycles and what was important about that is learning that yes we know that the earth is doing its own thing and that it has its own um, you know rotation and revolution but it's also not necessarily always going to be rotating the same way uh, one of the things that gets brought out here uh, is going to be known as the precession a procession traces out a cone over a period of 26,000 years. So what ends up happening like a top, when you're spinning a top, it spins, and then it starts to wobble a little bit. We also have what we call as perigee and apogee. Perigee is when the moon is closest to the Earth, and apogee is when the moon is actually farthest from the Earth. But precession is really an interesting cycle because we find that because of that tilt, yes, we are tilted, but how it deals as a top aspect. This is so, you know, the Earth is rotating, sure, but then when it starts doing this like a top, like right before a top starts to fall, that is called its precession. So it actually changes throughout the course of time. And we see that there's one... Um, a cycle every 26,000 years. Now, moving into the motions of Earth and Moon systems, I wanted to bring into the idea and the, you know, into the discussion about looking at the Moon phases. So that's really, I think, something that's kind of interesting. So uh, in this diagram, I'm able to kind of uh, express that. So we see phases of the Moon. The phases of the moon are progressional changes. Lunar phases are the result of the moon and sunlight reflected off of its surface. So what we can see is, if this, this represents the Earth, obviously, uh, this is the moon throughout the course of its cycle. Uh, and then here are the rays from the sun. So we can see that because of the sun, 
when it's hitting the moon during stage one, which is a new moon, we actually don't observe a moon because it's missing, right? Because the backside is what is being lit up. Then moving into the stage two, which is a part of a crescent, which is what it looked like here, that's a waxing crescent, crescent. Uh, we can see because then a portion of the moon is being hit by the sun and being lit up, and then that light is being reflected onto the earth so we can you know, observe it. We get the first quarter, which is the third stage. Then we get the gibbous, which is uh, the fourth uh, stage here, which is still a waxing uh, gibbous, which is just means that it's almost to a full moon. Stage five is a full moon where we can see the full moon. Uh, stage six is now a waning gibbous. The uh, stage seven is a third quarter, and stage eight is a crescent uh, waning. So you have waxing and waning. Um, so as you can see within this diagram here, what they're trying to express is that as the moon goes around the sun, uh, sorry, around the earth rather, uh, it is going to be hit with rays from the sun, which means that because <clears throat> that it's being hit with the rays from the sun at different times throughout its journey, we're going to be able to see and observe different portions of the moon. You may have heard that there's you know, the dark side of the moon, and that's because based on our observational point, we rarely see the opposite side of the moon itself, which is pretty cool. So uh, at any rate, uh, motions of the Earth-Moon system, so this takes us through then uh, our moon system, our phases of the moon. So we traditionally think of them as quarters, uh, you know, new, first quarter, this is going to be the half mark, third quarter, and then the going back to the new moon. But we also have these waxing and waning uh, motions of which when we start getting those crescents or the, the smile in the sky. Moving into this next piece, uh, this, this is motions of the Earth again, looking at solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. So a solar eclipse is when the moon moves in line between the Earth and the sun, therefore casting a shadow. And then a lunar eclipse is when the moon passes through the Earth's shadow. So this first one here, as we can see, there's the sunlight. The sunlight is hitting the moon. And you can see that then, for, therefore, there is a shadow being cast upon here. Then, looking here, we can see there's the sunlight shining on the Earth. And we can see then that there's the moon, so we can't observe the moon in that case. So I guess the big question for you is, based on these images, which one would be a solar eclipse and which one would be a lunar eclipse? So then moving forward, let's look at the surface of the moon. So there are uh, an observed amount of craters and depressions upon uh, the moon itself. We also see a summit of a volcanic form or meteorite impact. So we can see those here. So here we have what, what has been identified as a sea of tranquility, the Kepler crater. Uh, we can see the Copernicus crater, things that were observed by those people. So I guess the big question first comes from is, well, where does the moon even come from? <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it's really an interesting piece because uh, it actually came from an impact from the Earth. So the Earth received a very large impact during, you know, as the Earth was um, developing, and a large piece of the Earth after the impact was forced outward, and as it began to cool down, it turned into our moon. It got stuck within our gravitational field, and then has obviously undergone a tremendous amount of um, of impacts from extraterrestrial items, mostly because it has a very poor um, uh, atmosphere. So moving forward, uh, here's the moon's topography. It's looking at some of the different things. Uh, we've been able to observe uh, different types of rock material. We've been able to observe what we consider youthful craters, chains of craters, old lava flooded impacts. So as the plant, as the moon itself began to cool down, uh, it, you know, before it went completely cold, it did have um, some volcanic uh, material because it was at that point still molten. So kind of being able to see that, okay, so observing the moon's landscape, uh, it shows that it has had a tremendous history, uh, a very unique geologic history, so we can see that we have impacts of, uh, of breccia. Breccia is an angular sedimentary rock, um, which is usually brought in as things begin to settle down. Uh, we can see that there's different types of, uh, again, of different rock impact craters. So when we think of the moon, and we just can't think of it as one big white mass of material that has gone through a tremendous amount of, uh, has gone through a, quite a beating uh, within its, uh, its origin. 
And moving back to its origin, the lunar history, the most accepted model of the origin uh, as a body, the size of Mars, impacted Earth, resulting in debris that was ejected into space and eventually cooled down and united to become part of our moon. So this is uh, the, uh, the most widely accepted process. So uh, again, I know this was a shorter presentation, but that was kind of the point of it. So this is really bringing in to uh, name dropping a couple people in modern astronomy, looking at how it is an observational science that then turns into an interpretive science uh, as we continue to learn more and more about these processes. So uh, the next one we'll start looking at, uh, next presentation, we'll begin with touring uh, the universe, looking more uh, outside of just uh, of just Earth and our Moon or Sun, but start learning more about where we are in line with other planetary features and then looking at other different uh, solar systems and so on and so forth. So uh, nonetheless, um, appreciate your time and I hope you enjoyed it and we will talk soon.